What's good? What's up? What's, what's up? up? What's, what's up? up man? What's going, man? What's up? What's up, man? Great. What's good hey. with you? Pleasure Respect. to meet you, man. My guy. You got hey. it. Yes, sir. Pleasure, bro. Yes, sir. Damn, you guys, man. <laughs> that budget oh, nice man. on your what's side, up, huh? That budget nice. Decent, decent. That's right. Humble, man. Yeah. Hey, he came here. Freddie T. He came here limping, man. See, he's still hooping, hooping. See, we don't. How do you twist your ankle in layup line? KD and the, the guy from Memphis, oh. right? What's that Memphis? Had to Memphis? be wet. Had to be. I know somebody got fired over the, somebody, yeah. the floor being wet because he went up too regular. Like, I don't right. know. Could have gave out, I guess, but. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand, know. too. That's a little bitty leg for a size, like, 20 shoe. It's crazy. As, as well, you know what I mean? So you just never know. You take a misstep, man. You made like an alien now. KD's huh? an alien. Yeah. KD's not Literally. a human. You guys you gotta, been on it, man. I saw you had Kevin it. Hart, uh, yeah. Shaq. I think yeah. the first one I watched was Shaq. Yeah, that was, and then I just like binged out from there. Appreciate it. Right. Right. Even before this though, like I was, I've been on it. So right. appreciate Ooh, it, man. man. Thank you. Hold up, limitless. They got some cap pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. They got some cap pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Well, welcome to The Pivot. We got Channing, Freddie T, I'm RC, the professor is here. This is, for me, extremely nostalgic. I had pretty much every color and one you could possibly have. <laughs> I, was, I was one of those dudes that would watch the mixtapes or watch the stuff on ESPN, go outside with my basketball, attempt to do it and not be able to. So to have you sitting here, man, is really dope for well, us. Thank see, you. Let's uh, drink one. Let's drink one for us. Oh, so, and one. Oh, Just saying one. the name got me to stop, <laughs> man. I remember watching the videos. About, we'll roll it, about, 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 It's early, uh, bro. We, we uh, good. We're just going to toss up. Yeah, we'll toss up. We I will. Drink. Right. We will. Yeah. You know what I mean? Happy yeah, dad. Yeah, Appreciate y'all. <laughs> obviously, I watched the, the Netflix special as well. And, you know, you had some of the, the high school stuff. Just to be a freshman, be five foot. 85 pounds and have a dream of hooping at the highest level, what were those days like for you, continuing to work but understanding the obstacles you'd have to overcome mm -hmm. to make it where you wanted to be? I think, honestly, I didn't even understand what was needed, to be honest. Like, like I would just practice out of the passion for the game, you know what I mean? A lot of people will they'll look at my track and they'll be like, man, that was genius how you built the digital and did that but a lot of it just came from like loving the game you know what i mean so especially when i'm 15 years old i'm just spending all my free time playing basketball so whether that's in the driveway there was a gym 20 minutes away i used to walk or ride my bike to i just spent all my time in the gym so as far as my ecosystem and what i knew was actually like really small so like i'm thinking i'm going to the league <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? like like i'm a kid like i know i'm gonna stand out whenever i go to the park or uh, ever since i was in like fifth grade Whenever I would play, I'd like cross adults because like I had a trainer starting when I was in fourth grade. Yeah. And he taught me that Iverson crossover. Yeah. And so like people would always like love to watch when I play. They'd call people and like next thing you know, there'd be a crowd. So I was like crossing adults. So I figured, hey, if I'm 15 and I can I can beat adults one on one and even compete with some college players, I'm like, I got to go to the league. But, you know, me just not knowing politics of the game, what it's going to take. I was just an enthusiastic kid. Yeah. yeah. And that, how'd you grow up, man? What created the professor? Yeah. Well, I grew up in Kaiser, Oregon. It's like a super small town. It's an outskirt of Salem, the capital. Yeah. Nobody's ever heard of it, but no. <laughs> I think <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. A lot of what, what had to do with it was my dad. You know, he just loved the game and he played in like men's leagues and played pickup. And so I would just go and just like watch and just became a fan of the game. His passion for the game just wore off on me like probably by about second or third grade. I started playing when I was two, but yeah. uh, second or third grade, I like wanted to go to the NBA and be like my dad. And then what was key though is uh, my, my parents got me this trainer, this ball handling trainer before, now everybody's a trainer, right? And everybody has a trainer. But back in the day, it was like new, you know what I mean? This is the 90s, the, the early 90s. So when I was in fourth grade, I got that trainer and uh, this guy named Rodney Howard, he was really dope. He taught me like foundational ball handling stuff. You know, I remember the first movie taught me was like in and out then in and out crossover, right. and then the Iverson crossover, and that was like the game changer. So, yeah. But I picked them up quick. I knew I had a gift. I know now, looking back, it was a gift, because I picked these up in like a couple days, but mm -hmm. all I would do was play and get reps in doing those moves. And so I think that was really foundational, but also just, just the love for the game. You know, I spend countless hours hooping. You know, yeah. it's like 
parents now that ask me like, what, what does my kid have to do to get to where you're cool. at? Like how many days a week should he, be, he or she be practicing? And I'm always like, well, play college or pro or to be known globally, like you're gonna have to get your parents to make you practice less because getting on their nerve. My parents, I got on their nerves because all I did was play basketball and didn't do nothing else. You know what I mean? You never learned the UTEP two-step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course, of course. You know, I didn't know the name of it though. You know, right. when, I, when I was, I don't even know what I called that back in the day. Yeah, I, I guess I did. It was it was killer crossover though yeah, back killer, then. Yeah, that's what I think it was, some yeah. people called AIs the killer. It's yeah. kind of like mixed up, but no, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was early, the early. I was on that. Yeah. Yeah, that was the one. What was the process like in auditioning or yeah. trying out? How did that all come about? I really had no college offers. You know what I mean? Coming out of high school, I actually got cut from three JUCOs. Ended up finally landing on the local community college team only because my dad politicked with the coach. My dad owned a jewelry store and I bought jewelry from him. And so he talked him into giving me a look, just literally just giving me a look. And so the guy gave me a look and I actually worked out when I, when I scrimmaged against the uh, community college. So he saw I had some skills, but he didn't think I could guard anybody. So yeah. sure enough, there were a couple injuries. Next day I know I'm suiting up. Mm -hmm. I only play like three minutes a game. You know, I, I, like I'd go in during garbage time, we'd get dunked on, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like those guys, but that next spring summer though, I dedicated my whole life was back. Like it already was heavy basketball, but now it was like three a days, you know, make 500 jumpers at 5 a.m. before class, uh, open gym at like 2.30, then hit the weights and then the evening come work on my game some more. So I turned it up and next thing I know, I was like the best player in the gym. You know what I mean? Like, like we're going to open gym, my team's running it every game. So even the coaches, they're like, dang, this is like transformed in three months, but it showed me that dedication, you can you can change a lot in just a few months. So coming into AM1, I was just a fan, you know, Hot Sauce, Headache, AO, uh, Ali Mo, all these guys, they, they like shaped my game more than NBA players or just as much as Iverson, you know? So I just went up there as a fan, you know what I mean? And tried out, next thing I know, a crowd going crazy. The, the players were watching the game, you know, the open run tryout. And then the way it was, you got to, if you made it out of the tryout, you got to play against the AM1 team. Yeah. So for me, it was just it was just a dream come true that night. You know, if I would have played against them one time on ESPN, I was that was amazing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so how do you get to be on the tryout team before you can play against the guys? Mm -hmm. That that whole entire process. So how do you get to the front of the line? I, I visualize a short, small, skinny little white dude uh -huh. waiting for his shot. Yeah. You know, sign me up. You know, wherever I fall, but I gotta get there. So how what was that process like? I was so focused on my like game, like like coming back the next year to community college and trying to get a scholarship somewhere else that I was really, I was so much of a fan, I was just excited about that night. So, but I really just thought I had nothing to lose because I would have been a fan just watching it too, you know? So I just went in there like, hey man, every time I, it's always a show, it's always showtime I play. So I was like, might as well play, you know what I mean? Right. See what happens. And then it went for the good, but it was a few hundred people to try it out, probably played in like four or five, you know, I kept narrowing it down to the best of the best and then like, they picked two of us to go in the building and play against them. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's two of us. And then the other guys, the and one opposing teams, they were like, over, it was like a few overseas players, a few guys from the city before, and then like a couple dudes from that day. Just went in there and, you know, just had fun with it. The idea comes up, reality TV is starting mm. to get big. You know, you got The Bachelor and all of those things. Yeah. And the and one mixtape tour where you guys, it's like Survivor of the Hooper. You know, and you're a part of it. You're, you're coming from Oregon and, you know, you had dudes that could jump out the gym. You had mm. dudes that had handles. It's all these different things. When you are a part of that process mm. and every day you have to prove yourself in order to stay on that tour, what is that like to handle for a kid from Oregon mm. who had who went to the community college in the neighborhood and all that? And now all of a sudden you're on ESPN with all these dudes that you said shaped your game. Yeah. It was very surreal. I didn't know what the, the fame life would be like. You know, I had no clue. But it was funny because, well, two things. First, I didn't know how good I had gotten. You know what I mean? Nobody really, like my college coach had told me it got a lot better, but they didn't really affirm like how good. And I don't know if we knew because I'm only playing people at the, the JUCO level, right? Right. So I got a lot better. But also in terms of trying to like go through that survivor contest, I'm just happy to be there. Like I could have got sent home and it still would have been amazing to be on one or two episodes. Right. <laughs> That's the funny part. I actually wasn't told that like it was a contest that we were going on tour. I thought it was just about that day, you know, you play against the N1 team. Cause they did it the year before too. I actually played against the N1 team. People don't know that. Like I okay. played against it the year before and that was it. There was no go on the bus thing. So when they told me to go on the road, I didn't know nothing about it. 
And so, like, to compete for a contract, I found out, like, that night. Okay. So my sights didn't really get reset on doing that because I was thinking I was going back to school and, like... So how do you go home and tell your parents that, though? Like, when they say, hey, yeah. look, you can come on this tour and, you know, try to earn you a spot on the N1 tour. And you say, hey, mom, papa, we about to roll. Uh, I'm about to hop on this bus and go. Yeah. <laughs> With a bunch yeah. of dudes I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was the cool part. So basically, they did like a background check. You didn't leave that night. Okay. They had to do like a background check for a week and a half. So you miss the next game and then you come back on. So I think they went down to like Sacramento, LA. I missed those games. Then I came on to Phoenix or whatever. Mm. But no, I, I had told my parents thinking there was no way in heck they were going to let me go on this tour thing and I would go back to school. But they like supported it. They were like, oh, you, you got to do it. You know what I mean? But I think now looking back, it's like the, the investment in my game, you know, trainers, clinics, camps, Jordans. AAU, all, they probably feel like, hey, man, school ain't showing you no love. Like, right. why not? <laughs> How close are we to when you figured out this could be financially sound for mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Because you're just playing ball. Now, jumping on that bus, you could have been the brokest motherfucker on that bus riding, <laughs> oh, trying to sure. dribble, <laughs> dribble people and yeah. super-duper x cross or whatever <laughs> y'all was just yeah. talking about. <laughs> At what point did it become like you were like, damn, I can make bread? Probably up until the very end. I had a showdown with Hot Sauce in uh, Detroit. We had, like, a back and forth. Um... He came down and crossed me up. I actually slipped, I like like touched the ground, and then like I got back up and tried to get a piece of it. I got I, I tried to recover, but then he hit this three and they they lost it. Right, like I didn't even know what to do. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> like when it got loud in the and one game, it was like an NBA playoff game. Like right. real mm -hmm. talk, no exaggeration. So so I didn't really know what to think. But then I seen the our coach. He was like, go right back at him. You know what I'm saying? So right. I was like, all right. So I came down. I was, I was I did every move that I could even think of. I knew <laughs> I even did some of Hot Sauce moves on him like. <laughs> The right. last move is kind of like a little like sham, got like a little snatchback crossover. He went for it. Right. And I drove the lane. And I think I even got pushed down. And like I threw it up and I didn't even see it go in. But then they lost it even more All that. So that back and forth right there kind of gave me confidence. Like, you know what? Maybe, maybe I could do this. But I don't think I really thought I could actually like get a job and sign a contract until I actually won it at the very end. Right. Yeah, because the dudes like Helicopter and Spider, yeah. these dudes I was competing against, like they were nice though. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. These are like... Some of the most athletic dudes I've ever seen even till this day. Like, like till now, NBA, like, they were just crazy athletic. If you watch the, the doc, there is all of these dudes that you idolized and that really made and won what it was, and then there's you. There's a clear outlier here, right? Mm -hmm. You're the one white dude. It's not often that you're in that minority. That's like playing wide receiver in mm -hmm. the league. It's like playing cornerback. And sometimes that anomaly makes people famous and so you're there you're taking pictures and there's all these people before you what was the dynamic between you and the rest of the guys because it did seem like you rose to fame mm -hmm. extremely quickly i felt like a kid with adults you know what mm -hmm. i mean because even like hot sauce is like 10 years older than me some guys were in their 30s at that time you know what I mean? i'm 18 and they're they're like partying and hanging and they went from like adults to my friends that years in but like when i first got there like I almost felt like I didn't belong in their circle socially. So I was just trying to enjoy the ride. I was super quiet, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to basically learn too, you know what I mean? Like learn the ropes, how to approach a game. And then when I got on the and one team, that was kind of a hard figure out because the way they played, right? I never played that fast. Like I had my own speed at Showtime, but it wasn't quite that fast. They played like an NBA, you know, it's like, it's like a college player. You get an NBA run, you, your head's spinning, yeah. right? You think, like, dang, this game fast right. when you feel it. So I kind of felt like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just slowly learn the ropes. But socially, yeah, I was just quiet, just, yeah. you know. Speaking of socially and, yeah. like, honestly molding you, because yeah. I see you got the motherfucking G14 classified laser tape. Oh, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> you got the, <laughs> you yeah. got the, the very, yeah. it's, honestly, what I was talking to Travis Kelsey about. Uh -huh. Like, you pointed to the wrong color on the board at the barbershop. <laughs> but, but you're talking yeah. about being around all these OG, yeah. old ball playing black dudes. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. Is, that, is that what motivates Because you're from Salem, Oregon. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't dress like this in Salem, Oregon. No. Like he's, this, he's from the town outside of Salem, so that's even like worse. Yeah, it's even worse. That's even smaller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they probably think Supreme is a tractor or some shit. <laughs> like, like, yeah. I always was a fan of hip hop. I remember, like, even in '92, they had the NBA Jam Session VHS tapes. Do you yeah. remember these? Yep. It had like Biggie. It had like a bunch of dudes rapping on there with the highlights. So I was like really into that. And then I don't know why I was always into Showtime basketball. Like I was into Tim Hardaway mm -hmm. and Rod Strickland. Yep. Obviously, we all Jordan, you know, you know, top of the top. But then uh, when Iverson came in the league, then it was like, boom, and then the mixtapes. So I was into this hip-hop basketball and that whole lifestyle. But 
I was an outcast for that because most people where I'm at, they were in like rock music or yeah. alternative yeah. stuff like that. Now it's different, right? If I go yeah. back, everybody yeah. does hip hop now, but you mentioned my haircut. People always still talk, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the mixed opinions. But <laughs> I, uh, when I got on the tour, it's funny, I went to a commercial shoot. I think after I got the contract, we did a commercial shoot for the clothing or something. And it was in New Jersey and main event had his barber up there. And he actually gave me, like, he he was like, he looked at my hair, it was looking crazy. He was like, hey, man, let me just transform you real quick. And I was like, all right, cool. And he actually cut it a lot like this. Like, uh, <laughs> it was the first, hey, he got back in the mirror, he was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was like, ooh. Yeah, but I already, I had like the, I just cut it on a two. You right. know, like, it was just easier for me, especially as a ball player. I, I never was a comb my hair type person. I, yeah. People are always like, why don't you spike it? I, I don't even know what that's like. I don't, it's just, yeah. it, was, it wasn't me, you know? So. You talk about the, the speed in which those guys was playing when you had an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to play against them. Mm -hmm. 2003. You had an opportunity to play in, in the gardens. Yeah. What was that? Just stepping in the garden to say, you know what? I'm about to play in Madison mm. Square Garden today. I'm sure that had to be a surreal moment for you. Yeah, it was. The stakes of that game were extra high, too. I mean, I'm not going to lie. My stomach would tighten up crazy. Because like he said, the most people I ever played against before and what was like, Maybe 100, 150 right. or something. My Juco only had one side of bleachers. Same with my high school. <laughs> so to go in there and play in arenas was like, it was a trip. I, I remember my stomach would tighten up real tight before the games, but I, I swear, like, after one minute of run up and down, I never had no problem. I didn't think about the crowd or nothing. So I learned that about myself as I went. But then we got to the garden. It was different because it was, like, a bunch of celebrities. Yeah. yeah. Uh, street ball was a genre, it was his own big genre at that time. So mm -hmm. every street baller who was anybody who was in the building from mm -hmm. Skip to My Lou, uh, a lot of rappers, DJ Clue. I think he was even suited up on our team. I feel like everybody was there in basketball. But right? you also had the, the pro guys that wanted to to maintain that street edge yeah. and, you know, be a part of it. And they would show up too, right? Yeah, NBA players, yeah. Mm -hmm. NBA players were, were always playing our game kind of like they would like the Drew League or something yeah. today. Right. Um, so that was always really cool. But yeah, in the Madison Square Garden, it just felt like that game, like I don't think my stomach loosened up in that game probably until about like after the first quarter. But those games were hard. You know, I didn't even come alive in that game until the fourth quarter because it's an all-star showcase, right? Mm -hmm. It's those aren't like games where you like play like three quarters or something like that. Right. So some games I might play 10 minutes, some might be 15, mm -hmm. might go crazy one or you might get 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember that game. I think we had probably like 20 dudes on the bench, right? Cause right. everybody, they like, wanted to, they're play like, there. oh, he's a name in New York, suit him up against the N1 team. So right. it was like tons of dudes. And I think in the fourth quarter, I started came alive. So they just like left me in for the rest of the game. But, but you hit the game winning three pointer. Yeah. Take us through that moment. Yes. I think the play before that, sick with it, it hit like what would have been the game winner. He hit a shot with like a second left or two seconds left or something like that. And sick with it was like super good. He's actually who I matched up with most that first year. But he was like MVP of the Drew League multiple times. Right. You know what I mean? He was like a D1 a player. player was, yeah. A D1 player. I just had limited Juco experience. So I'm always going against this dude. And I was getting moves off, but he was like, oh, he was tough. Yeah. So he hit that game winner. So I'm in my mind, like, this is already over, but... They're talking about winning, you know, all the OGs like, hey, man, we got to gotta get this done. So I'm like, all right, because the future was on our team and the pharmacists. They told, the they, names, bro, the names are yeah. so cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, were, they were hyping me up like, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? You already hit a game winner a month ago because we, we beat them for the first time like a month before that. And I hit yeah. a buzzer shot. So it was just like trippy. It's, these moments couldn't be duplicated. It's like God's plan. <laughs> and I don't even know why I was, why am I shooting a game winner? The future is the MVP of the Rucker, you know what I mean? Right. But I think it, it was like a scramble. Like, this is how I know it's God's plan. We just went out there and they're like, hurry up. You know what I'm saying? Like, they hurried us up. I don't even think Team A, I don't even think they were matched up. And so I was like standing in a place where I didn't even think I should shoot. But then by the time I got it, I was like, oh, I have to shoot. Right. <laughs> so I pulled up. It's probably like 10 feet, literally 10 feet behind the three. It's kind of a surreal moment. That it happened fast, but it was also like in slow motion at the same time. And then uh, all I remember hit that three is I lost it. It was pandemonium. And like, the rest is history. Yeah. Wow. And talking about the nickname, it's fun. The nostalgia of these nicknames, man. Because yeah. I can't think of their faces, but sick with like I remember yeah. hearing those names watching it, watching on watching on the weekend. They always yeah. had it playing on the weekend. When I saw that you were gonna bless us with your presence, <laughs> and I saw the nickname, two things popped up in my mind. Either, you know, you're a professor, you're teaching people. And all, or you look like a goddamn professor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> where, where did that nickname come from? You know, I think I asked Duke Tango this one time, but I, I can't even remember what he said. <laughs> I think when he when it was marketing, he said like schools people like the professor. You know, he's taking people to school. He's the professor. But I think it had a lot to do with just how I looked at that time too. Yeah. Because he gave me a name the first the first game I played. 
But he was just witty like that. He would do it because if you call a street ball game, instead of saying the dude over here, it's just better to have a name. So yeah. they gave out names a lot quicker, like on that tour. Yeah. But he felt like I earned it because it like it was long standing and there was a lot, you know, some years behind it. But it was probably both. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but what's cool? But in, even in that, how we think about the names, you being a fan of street ball mm -hmm. and having knowing who he is and what he means to street ball mm -hmm. to get a name that quickly or do enough on the court where they are already recognizing you that had to be one of those moments where all the work i've put in has finally gotten me here and then you hit the shot in madison square garden does that five foot freshman think about everything it took to get you to that point after you hit a shot like that i think so i think after i hit the shower after i won the contract and then it was funny, we were like celebrities overnight. Yeah. You know, I remember in the hotel watching the TV show. And I was a kid, they probably had filled me in, but like I didn't I didn't know. So like when I watched it, I thought it was like season one where it was about the guys, right? The and one players. I thought maybe if I paused it, you might see me get a bucket or like right. <laughs> might be in there a little bit. But we were it was about the guys trying out. I wasn't filled into that. So so when I watched the first episode, I remember we were like in Mississippi watching the first episode and came on I was like and I was the, the whole thing right you know what I mean and so it tripped me out but literally I remember going outside that next day and it was like crazy so it's literally a celebrity in like one day for us it's he played at Florida he played at Florida I played at LSU it's the natural progression of life if you excel yeah. on the field this was a totally different route and then you take another route because it is a situation of okay how long is street ball going to last? How can I move into the next thing? And you've done a great job of doing that. You started a YouTube in like 2009, yeah. right? Your own page. And now, man, you've done all these dope things. About four years ago, you posted a video. You went to jail yeah. and played. What was that experience mm -hmm. like for you? Because a lot of times people don't treat inmates as humans. Mm -hmm or that they can have fun or even just want to be around them and that. And I thought for you to be a celebrity and to go do that and give them that kind of day of reprieve from what they're, they see inside those walls every day was just big of you, man. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh, humble, man. Um, there's a guy who shoots probably like a third of my YouTube videos. The ones that are more high quality, look like a TV show, it's usually him doing it. A guy named Jay Lyons, he's awesome. We had kind of met, shook hands on possibly doing a documentary at some point, but along the way, he asked me, hey, because we're both Christians, so he was like, hey, do you want to go to this prison and give your testimony? I think it would be really cool. He's like, I got hired by this, this uh, company, the Prison Fellowship, it's a ministry. And uh, he's like, do you want to tell your story up there? And he's like, maybe, he's like, if we could get cleared to play ball in the prisons, I think it could be a good video also. And I was like, oh, the prison? Like, dang. <laughs> I was like, I didn't really know what to expect. But, it, but at the same time, I was like, you know, it could be impactful. Like, maybe it'll be a good thing. So I was like, all right, cool. Let's, you know, let's give it a shot. And so we went up there and I actually told my story at three, three prisons that were kind of in that area. But then we got cleared at that one. A lot of times when I have third party people film my videos, they don't do it right. Because they try to like cinematize the ball. Like there, there's a lot that goes into making a dope like YouTube vlog or like a good hoop video. Right. So like... I didn't really think much of it, but I was like, hey, maybe this would be impactful. So the testimony part was received super well. And then uh, we got cleared to hoop. And I, it's funny though, I played for like 45 minutes. I don't think I missed a shot. Like, <laughs> like literally, it was like one of those moments, right? Yeah. It was just meant to be. Like I literally, I may have missed like two shots and every move I ever pulled out worked. It was crazy. But then everybody was like, they were cool. Some dudes were like a little abrasive, but it was, it was pretty cool for the right. most part. They had a good time. And I think you, you made a good point. That's what I got going away from it was like, Man, you know, they're still human. They made bad choices, especially at that maximum security. But I was glad that I did it because it felt like it was the time of their life. You know right. what I mean? Just that day and getting, getting a little notoriety on camera and stuff like that. So when you are in the world that you were in and they're featuring you, those aren't things they talk about. Even in seeing your video with you in the prison, that isn't something that's spoken of. When you're giving your testimony and speaking about how God has poured into your life what are some of the things you try to communicate to people about that mm. well that video it's it's in there it's just mm. like sprinkled in we knew if we went if we went heavy. like heavy heavy evangelistic then that like it might not get as far you know yeah. what i mean some of the things i try to convey i mean my life was super changed you know what i mean i became christian 2011 it was actually at escalade's funeral believe it or not mm. escalade was my closest friend on the mixtape tour his brother is 
Mark Jackson. Yep. You know, Mark was doing the eulogy at the at the funeral, and I had known Mark because he came to the games. We were cool. So I was just listening to everything he was saying, you know what I mean? And I was like remembering because I went to a Christian preschool and a Christian high school my senior year. And I just conf felt compelled to give my life to Christ, you know, when they did an altar call at the end. And then um, just had a major transformation in my life. I, I, that's like the, the turning point in my life, like 2011, mm -hmm. like after and one and all that, going broke, you know what I mean? All, all those things. So what I try to convey to people, I usually have to tell them my story, you know, just, just to try to keep it real and how things happen and how my life is better now. And, you know, we're on a better track, obviously, and how it's changed my life for the good in a whole bunch of ways. So what going broke though i was gonna say you, you said go broke how was the money structure yeah. back then as uh -huh. well like you say you signed a contract when i hear contract i think of our type of contracts but i know it's not like football contracts like mm. where did the money come from how did how did yeah. you how did you maintain yourself how did you let basketball and you're not a professional right now that that financially fuels your life where 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 are the numbers i think my first contract i signed maybe was like between 60 to 80k something like that Mm -hmm. And then it would always go up 10 or 20K as we went along. I know the last deal I signed was like 200K, 250K or something. And it would go year by year. Because yeah. the pinnacle of the popularity is probably like the year I, I tried or the year after. And then it kind of like went slowly down from there. But we made more and more money, funny enough. And then the company got bought out 2006. But it was bought out by some people that really didn't know much about basketball, much less streetball. Yeah. And they brought in people to head up the branding from like Reebok and Adidas. But these cats weren't, in, they're not into street ball. Like they didn't really know that was the DNA. I think they knew it was the DNA, but they wanted to like expand. But I feel like since the brand had already been kind of going down, it wasn't the time to expand into other yeah. things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When our contracts ended in 08, I think probably like the, the TV deal ended, the production deal with ESPN. We didn't even get a call, nothing. It was, wow. just, it was just over. And then money, you know, stopped coming in. I was kind of like living check to check. You know, like when you're young, I was super young. When it ended, people don't even know. When and when ended, I was only 24, 25. You know, I started when I was 18. So, yeah. so I, I, hadn't, I didn't have an advisor. I didn't know how to manage money. It was, I was spending a lot. I had like four-story condo in West LA, Mercedes, <laughs> uh, place in Oregon too, where I'm from. So I was just spending a lot month to month. And then I actually, oh, funny enough, I saved my and one jerseys. I saved in a box, probably a bit as big as this little uh, footrest right here. I kept all my jerseys, probably a couple hundred of them. I actually, I sold them on eBay. I actually lived off of that. Wow. I sold them, but they would go for like a thousand, a thousand a jersey. But it got to a point where really there was no gigs. When street ball was over, it like dried up. Because I remember even AI, they called that carry, a, they called that crossover a carry. Mm -hmm. And that changed basketball altogether right then. People didn't really know it unless you were in it. But no more street ball exhibition games. No, no endorsement, obviously. No commercials, no nothing. It was like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I, do I start training kids? Like, mm -hmm. what do I do here? But what I did was I sold those jerseys. I started my YouTube channel. And then I was still, the footage, the content on YouTube, you look at the, my first videos, like when I'm playing overseas. And one was still crazy overseas because before digital, you couldn't even follow the narrative of a different country. You know what I mean? Before the internet. So they're still thinking it's like, on high, right? We're only right. three years, three years removed from it being wow. A-list, top tier of the sports world. So I did like and one Africa, and one Brazil, Russia, you know, just like random and one game. So I was doing that for a few years and then another company tried to relaunch and one. They tried to kind of like revamp it. It didn't really work out, but it kind of financially it held me over until YouTube went, started going viral like 2013. Speaking of going viral, pivoting from playing ball with prisoners yeah. to pick up ball as Peter Parker, your Spider-Man series. Oh, yeah. That went viral. I think it has about 50 million views to date. You dropped it like nine, 10 years ago or something like that. The creatives behind that, what convinced you to say, I'm going to put on a Spider-Man costume uh, and go hoop? That was my first attempt to actually go viral. So I was just, you know, from 2000, I was actually making YouTube to 06, believe it or not, because when we were on and one, people would rip the highlights from the show and then they throw them on YouTube, but they're getting like five, 10 million views per vid. It would be like the hot sauce compilation, main event compilation, professor compilation. Yeah. So I was like, we should do this. This could encourage more bookings outside of N1. Cause back in that day, you could get a DM on YouTube. So you could get like bookings. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I tried to flood it. This is before you had your own channel, before AdSense. And then when AdSense came about, that's why I started my own page 2009. Okay. So I had been on it 
a kid taught me to edit. There was like a, this high school kid was uploading all of our episodes and he was like making these fly mixes, but he lived in San Diego. So I actually hit him up and I asked him, could you like show me how to, how you do this thing, you know, and edit. So I learned how to edit firsthand. And so from 2009 up until that Spider-Man series of 2013, I was editing my own videos if I happen to get the footage from the game. And then once in a while, I have somebody film on a Sony Handycam. <laughs> I teach them how to film a little on my yeah. Sony Handycam and then I edit the footage. But it was real just like on the side, you know, we're not, we're not super focused mm -hmm. on it. But one of my homies, uh, this dude, Robert Monroe, he was the first dude to show me how to use like a DSLR camera and kind of like really put me on YouTube, you know, like the, the norms of like vlogging and stuff like that. He was like, man, why don't we try to go viral, try to do something, something crazy? He's like, one of these vids, you got like half a mil, you didn't even try, you know? So I was like, all right, let's do it. But so he came up with the prank idea, you know, dress as a superhero, play people one-on-one, -on -one, don't take it off. It'd, so it'd be like a prank. We didn't even really know, though. We combined like five genres. It was like prank, comedy, sports, yeah. you know, wow factor, like all these things. And um, I went out there, I put on that little suit. I played for like 20 minutes, like literally played for like 20 minutes. But again, it was one of them weird moments. I didn't miss a shot. Every move worked. Not that the comp was heavy, but it was just fun. Right. And then um, I left. It was funny because I edited the video myself. So I, I edited for like three hours, but then I was still touring at the time. We were on this tour. It's called a ball up tour. Yep. So we were getting ready. We had a game in Chicago um, like the next day. So I had to fly out at like 5 a.m. So I uploaded it, but I didn't know how to compress footage at times. So it would take like 15 hours to upload. Mm -hmm. So I went to sleep and then I got up and the joint was still uploading. I'm like, dang. So I just got said, screw it. I'll just leave the computer on all weekend. It'll be good. Like, I don't care. I ain't got no money anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> by the time I got to LAX though, it uploaded. And I remember before they had pushed notifications, they had like email notice. So I got like email notification. This video had like 350K when I got to LAX. But I remember double taking like 350K. Right. <laughs> that ain't right. And then uh by the time I got in the plane, it was a million. And by the time Damn. I got Chicago, it was like three million. And back in that day, the algorithm's different now. It's a lot more friendly, right? People can do like, you could do five mil in a few days. Right. Back then, if you did like five to 10 mil in a week, that was like, that's like having 50 mil today. It was like a true viral video. Mm -hmm. So I got hit up by like everybody you can think, CNN, ESPN, Good Morning America, TMZ, everybody had hit me to see if they could use the... Right. You know, the, the footage for their story or whatever. So I was like, cool. But that's what blew up my YouTube channel. I, I got a million subs overnight. Dang. A million subs overnight? Yeah, literally. I had, I had 17. I found a screenshot from my old channel, actually not even that long ago. And I had 17,000 subs. And uh, I literally got to, a, it got to like 800K overnight and then slowly got to a million. Dang. But yeah. You mentioned traveling and playing in Ukraine, Angola, different places. Yeah. You had malaria. Oh, yeah. Correct? Yeah. At, uh -huh. at one point. That experience of, okay, we're going to just hoop and play basketball, something I've always loved to do, to now kind of battling for your life. And yes. what was that like for you? It was weird because we had never been to Africa. And one was in 40 countries, and maybe it was in one of the countries in Africa, but we would only go where the retail stores were. So, like, for whatever reason, we didn't go to Africa. But and one was crazy in Africa because I would just see on, online, right? People right. always commenting. So it was my first time going there. We played in Angola. It ended up being my last and one game of all time. So going out there, the sponsor of the tour was the airline. We flew private out of Houston. There was some airline that goes from Houston to Angola. It was like a big commercial plane, but every seat was first class. It was crazy. Right. I never seen nothing like that. So we sponsored by it, flew out there, got to the airport in Angola, and then they were like, they asked us as an option, like, do you want to get your shots and take the pills, like, for whatever? And, like, we're funny at the time. We don't really know. We're like, nah, I don't know. No needles. You know what I'm saying? I'm good. We're only here for a game. So we passed on it. But now, no, it's the dumbest thing ever, right? You go to Africa, right. India, you got your shots. So one of my teammates got sick right away, and he was out of there. And then after the game, I remember went to sleep that night, and I woke up. My bed was, like, all sweated out, like, on another level, though. Like, like this much water on the entire bed. Like, it was nasty. So I woke up, and... I, get, I, I felt a little like out of it. She was like, you want to go get looked at? I was like, sure, I'll go in there. So I go to the hospital. The teammate that had the fever or whatever, he passed me. <laughs> he was getting out <laughs> as I was going in. And then I get in there and they start talking or whatever, and they told me I had malaria. And I was like, nah, I feel fine. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? I can't be malaria. I feel a little weird, whatever. And then like an hour later, I was like, like I'm white now. I was white as this jacket. <laughs> like it was crazy, like in an hour. And I was out of there. But I was there for like three weeks. Dang. And so, yeah, I even got, like, I had a flip cam before they had, like, selfies and all that. I said some last words on a flip cam. I thought I was going to die. Wow. It was yeah. wild. So 
But I took the medication. It takes away your hearing and it takes away your, your taste. It was, it was, way, it was quite crazy, but I was there for like three weeks trying to recover from that and finally, finally got out of there, you know, healthy. But <laughs> this, this is an old dude question. I ain't going to lie to you. Sure. What insurance paid for that? Because you, did you have N1 insurance? You know what? I don't even think I paid the bill. I never paid it. Your face dirty in Mongolia. Well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. The, the promoter was cool though. She sat there bedside with me. The, the team had to go though. They had like they had a game in Puerto Rico and somewhere right. else, so they they had to dip. And I I couldn't blame them. You know what I mean? It's not like they're going, you know, not go because they just thought I was casually sick. Right. You know. To be fair, in malaria, I think especially now it's real casual. Like you get it, you take the treatment, you're fine. Right. I think back then it was sort of. Weird, weird grounds or whatever, but they thought I'd be fine. That's crazy. So, so yeah, but I remember, I, th I think they paid it. I don't know, the promoter, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I you look back on it now, man, and all the things you've accomplished, you've been in movies, you've started and been mm -hmm. on other tours, you're CEO of your own company. When you see how far you have come, like how proud of you are you of that kid mm. from Oregon. You know, humble, yeah, definitely proud. I, you know, all the all the work put in. I think it's funny because it's such a unique route, right? Like you, we play ball at the beginning. You want to go to the NBA, but the fact it turned out this way. I think some people think I'm regretful, like like because I didn't make the NBA. You know, I was trying to make the NBA while I was on and one. A lot of people don't know that. And I got to the CBA, which is like the old G League. Yeah, mm -hmm. it didn't work out. But it's funny because I I saw how political it was, and like I still don't pass the eye test, and then. In that day, and one was frowned upon, you know, by by like b-ball elites, you know, GMs, and yeah. they not respecting that and one. So like having that tag on my name was difficult. Like even Skip, he had to change his game. Mm -hmm. You know, Ray, Ray, Ray had to awesome. change yeah, yeah. his game to fit the mold of the NBA and get, kind of like dumb down to Showtime a little bit. So I was dealing with it on steroids because I didn't even look the part, and like it's like the CBA, and like nobody's at the game anyway, so putting on a show don't even make no sense. But yeah, I have no regrets. I'm definitely. Proud, you know, thank God for the, you know, the path that, that I've taken and what's come of just, like you said, the kid spending all those hours working on the game. But those guys are so great at and one. Why do most of them? You got Skip to my Lou. You yeah. got a couple yeah. guys that made in the league. But yeah. majority of guys don't make it in the league. Right. This will be my guess. I don't want you to get mad at me. No, you're good. All of y'all are defensive liabilities. Y'all work on dribbling and doing all that stuff. Y'all yeah. get on the other side of the court and y'all can't stop a damn child. Am I wrong? <laughs> No, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> no, here's what, here's what I think. A lot of guys, like, like, you know how it is in the NBA? It's like guys have the complete package. So, like, somebody like AO, who definitely had NBA talent defensively, offensively, everything. But, like, maybe at that time, time maybe, maybe he wouldn't want to be coached. You know what I mean? Like, he's a little used to just be, you know, playing street ball, doing your own things. And, like, he never lifted a weight. Mm -hmm. So like, so, you know, playing the league, you don't have to lift weights, you know uh -huh. what I mean? So I think like people lacked, so, or some people were tweeners, right? I think even like, say like main event, like he's, he had NBA talent. He played a Rucker, if an NBA player, he, he's going to get his against that dude too, right? But, and he, he plays D, like he's like yeah. Barkley, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he could fly, but he's like, you know, he's like 6'4", 6'5", mm -hmm. but he kind of plays like a Barkley. So is he going to get a shot in the NBA playing like a 3-4, where nowadays they're like 6-9, you know what I mean? I so, like, you. I think some guys were tweeners. But I think that what was what was interesting about it is the talent level was super high. It's funny. It's even like with me today. Some people think the talent was higher than it was. Somebody would be like, oh, man, I love, you know, you know, Professor and Iverson, man. They, they should go head to head. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like, right. so, that was a narrative back then, right? right? But then some people would be like, oh, these dudes can't play at all. They're garbage. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's even like with me, like, my fan is always like a big divide of like opinion or whatever. Yeah. But the, no, the truth is, like, it was actually a very high, it was the highest level I played. I mean, think about it. I played at community college. This way, like, if and one played my Juco team, it would just be old. Like, <laughs> it's not even a game, right? Even the right. D1 team. I don't know if D1 teams could beat the and one Like, we because we play overseas. We would play D2 and D1 overseas teams when we go play. And we put on a show and kill it, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, I feel like it was underestimated by a lot of people. Around the time you were uh, getting ready to go on, on the and one tour, uh, was this around the same time Jay Will, White Chocolate, yeah. had entered the NBA 
And, and having seeing someone like J. Will, similar game, molded in the same style, fancy. We hadn't seen a point guard, definitely not a, a white point guard, mm -hmm. to do the things he was doing, dribbling, hitting by in the back, all that stuff. How much did that inspire you to keep your hopes and dreams alive that you can make it to the NBA and do those same things? Oh, man. Or did you even watch J. Will? No, I love J. Will. Yeah, mm. I love it. Because J. Will and Iverson, like after Jordan, it was like J. Will and Iverson. These are my guys. You know what I mean? Mm. He was super inspiring, but I did know he took a different path, right? He was a D1 player. Yeah. Yeah. He's 6'2". Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I just went the other day. He's definitely bigger than I am. He outweighed me by a lot. Being that he already had taken that D1 path, I felt like he already had the edge, right? Like, mm. I don't know if it inspired me to do it, because I knew for me it would be like this whole other, I would have had it been like, like Rudy to make the NBA, you know what I mean, at that time. But I was inspired by his play style. Like, I always tried to do that elbow pass and like. That joke was cold. Though. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. Really quick. Yeah. We would play at the rec at UF. He ended up leaving Marshall and going to Florida. Okay. So we came across uh, cross paths and we the, the football guys would play at the campus rec. You see him, you see us, vice versa. We were coming down on a break, three, three on one, and he did the fucking elbow pass. Before he did it, showed the NBA okay, he could do okay. it. And he, he hit it that way, and it came back to me. Out of bounds. <laughs> me up. I wasn't ready for it. Oh, but it hit you in the chest? <laughs> no, it, I didn't even see the fucking <laughs> ball. He's like, Freddie, you got to keep your hands up. And he did the shit again. Breaks. Wow. But it's so many moves, so nice. It's so amazing. Like, I was just honored to be out there and then to see him do it in the NBA. That's fire. It's crazy. My, my, but my game was whack. <laughs> my, my last question is this. The mixtape tour yep. was bigger than N1. The apparel yep. and shoe brand. And it ended up being basically a culture and entity in its own. And I don't even know that they were ready to handle. And if you kind of watched the doc, they weren't. Are you, though, the most famous of the N1 ballers? Like today? Oh, I think today. I think a lot of those guys were, like I said, they were halfway through their career or even some of them were in the fourth quarter of their career at that time. And then also, they weren't really, like, we all did social media, but, like, we were using it to, like, chase girls, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think I was the only one that was doing it for branding. And maybe it's because I was from the young, I was, like, a younger generation, and I saw, like, I remember we went to Paris, France, and some kids ran up on it like professor profit you know they, right. or whatever and they were and i was like oh thanks for watching the show i appreciate that and they're like no youtube youtube we saw you so i had foreseen that this could be like the new tv when we didn't have a tv show so i was the only one like to brand out like that hot sauce was mainly the headliner you know, like when i was there right you know and i give them majority of the credit too because they built and one you know what i mean like i was a fan i came on like the halfway yeah i feel like it was it was on the way up, and then I came on to help it like go to just hit the, the tip, you know, make the peak, the to pinnacle. top it off, yeah, yeah, right to the to the pinnacle, and then when it got bought out a couple years later, then it like started to go down. I think that like I wouldn't be who I am without them. Yeah, you know, I respect that, man. Thank you so much for coming through, bro. Yeah. I think, you know, when you were a part of like our era and our generation, getting an opportunity to watch and one basketball was what like hoopers dreamed of, you know, cause like everybody could think I can go get a ball and I can try this or I can do this. When you watch Michael Jordan, it was like, I know for sure I can't do that. And it turned out I couldn't do what y'all were doing either, man. But we appreciate you, bro. Continue to do the things that you're doing. Also keep inspired. Hey man, humbled. And I, I even get a chance to tell you, man, congrats on your guys' success too. I mean, appreciate I'm it. humbled Thank to be sitting here with you. you guys are like beast athletes yeah. yourself. And then I saw like the episodes and the the caliber of people you had on here, so humble, man. Appreciate, appreciate you, guys. you, too, Thank you We appreciate the jewelry, <laughs> yeah. the jewelry man. <laughs> Dude, Pops got him on. Yeah. Yeah. Pops got him on. Likewise, love, bro. Thanks for so sure. much. Oh, man, man. appreciate that you. Sweet. That was good, yeah. man. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pinning it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pinning it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling.